what is Christianity anymore? What does it mean? He needs you. Oh, you're breaking his heart. No, he's going to break you. Andrew Tate had a strong message for Christians, but Pastor Vody Bokum has a brilliant response. What is Christianity anymore? What does it mean? You, you can go to a Christian country, and America, let's take, for example, and you'll get in more trouble for insulting George Floyd than you will for insulting Jesus Christ. Yeah, for sure. You Literally, you can walk down the, t- the, the, walk down the street with a t-shirt saying Jesus is gay. Girls barely go to church. If they do, who knows what they were doing the night before. Mm. None of it means anything. And then if you go and find a Christian that says, this trans person has, has changed gender, what do you think about that? Christians are so soft, they're going to go, well, I hope he finds redeem, and I hope they, you know, he finds guidance. Haram, bro. Haram. <laughs> no, you didn't. It's haram. And I like that. It's <clears> yes <throat> and no. And what's the, point in, what's the point in a religion if you're too afraid to say what you believe in? or afraid to stick up for it, or afraid to to defend it. So according to Andrew Tate, Christians are too busy being little babies than to stand up for what is right. And now, just because Christians misrepresent Christ doesn't mean that there's a problem with Christ. But there are still plenty of Christians who are standing up for the truth and what is right. But he does touch on something here, and it's that A lot of people who call themselves Christians and many people who live in what we call Christian countries are very comfortable disregarding what the scriptures say, very comfortable disobeying Christ. And it's because we have a fundamentally flawed view of Jesus. I despise the picture that's painted in our culture of this sissified, needy Jesus. Amen? And that's who he is. He's a sissified, needy Jesus. He's just yearning for you. He's longing for you. He wants friendship and relationship with you. He needs you. Oh, you're breaking his heart. No, he's going to break you. (laughs) Newsflash. By definition, God is self-sustaining, self-existent, and self-sufficient. Therefore, by definition, he needs nothing. God does not need you. And he's going to prove it one day because you're going to die and the world's going to keep on spinning at the same rate it was before you were here. And somebody's going to get all your stuff. He's waiting for you, all right. (laughs) Revelation 19, beginning in verse 11. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. He judges and makes war! It's my God. Yeah, I got some issues, but that's all right. His eyes are like a flame of fire, On his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of the God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's my Jesus. That's the God whom I serve. Not the sissified Christ that's preached in pulpits around the United States of America. I serve the great God of the universe who gets angry and pours out his wrath. I serve the great God of the universe who demonstrated his wrath when he poured it out on his own son. And it amazes me that we believe this, that God would crush and kill his own son, but let you slide. Not for a minute. The spotless, sinless lamb of God suffered and bled and died because of the wrath of God that propitiation, the satisfaction of the righteous wrath of God, that's what was experienced on the cross. How dare we take that lightly? 
That's the one against whom you've sinned. Not this sissified Jesus with hair like the Brett girl with a lamb across his shoulders. So what Vody Bokum highlights here is that Jesus is love. This is what the Bible means when he's referred to as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, right? And there's a reason, if you, you see this hat and this top, I did this very intentionally, yeah? Link below in the description, but hear this. Jesus came as the Lamb of God, the sacrifice to take away our sins. So you've got the Lamb there, but he is coming again as the King who will reign in righteousness and who will justly punish sin. And the Bible talks about him being the lion of the tribe of Judah who reigns with justice and who reigns with strength. This is why the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 28, Christ having been offered once to bear the sins of many will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who eagerly wait him. And it's understanding that the next time Jesus comes, he is coming to save those who are trusting in him, whose sins have been forgiven because we believe in him. But he's coming to punish the unjust in his righteousness. In fact, his word tells us he will say to those on his left, these are the unrighteous ones who did not submit to him. Depart from me, you are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So don't take God's kindness for weakness. Don't take the fact that God has been patiently allowing us to live and allowing many people to claim him whilst really and truly their hearts are far from him to exist. Don't get twisted. God's not sleeping. He's not slumbering. There's coming a day. There's coming a day. And we ought to be warning people of that day and calling them to salvation in Christ. Now, I hope this video has blessed you. I'll see you in the next one. Peace and blessings.